Now let us continue in this aspect of the charismatic movement. Right, four movements. Very quickly, I want to keep um, drain, uh, drilling this into us. The four movements, what's the first one that we study? That's the easiest. The Roman Catholic Church, all right? Huge, billions of people around this world, but a false Christianity. What's the second one? Um, Noah. Very good. The ecumenical movement, all right? The ecumenical movement is where Revelations 18, 19, um, 20 tells us about the one world church, the false um, organization movement that will bring everything together, false religions and all together to form the one world church which Satan will head, all right? Satan will lead. Now, then the third movement, which in? Charismatic movement, right? That's what we are studying now. And the last one, um, Thomas, New Evangelical Movement, all right? So please be very conscious of this because you will have friends in this movement and you must be able to discern and, and know and therefore be careful and help them, all right? Now, come back to the charismatic movement and regarding tongue speaking, regarding tongue speaking. Now, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, some of the arguments that they have 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, the Christian must be able to divide the Word of God clearly, accurately. Otherwise, two things will happen. Number one, you yourself may fall into falsehood when they use the Word to convince you. Number two, you are unable to help them to come out of the false movement, unable to help them to see the truth. Now, what about this argument, all right? Um, First Corinthians, sorry, chapter 14. Chapter 14. Now, let us read from verses 1, um, verses 1 to, to four, 1 to 4, all right? 1 to 4 reading. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now here, one of the arguments that, that the charismatic often um, bring to you is this. Now, I say, why do you tell us to stop speaking in tongues? Well, a few things we already covered. Tongues have ceased, all right? We understand that from the Greek language. It is, it is no more to come back. It has ceased. That word cease means end, all right? No more, never again. So tongue has ceased. But they say, well, but don't you think... Now, look at verse, verse 1. Now, it says, but desire spiritual gifts. God wants you to desire spiritual gifts. Now, number two, um, look at... Now, please remember... Uh, the word unknown, unknown is in italics. I want to emphasize this again and again. Unknown is in italics means this word does not exist in the original language. The KJV translators put it there, italicize it to let you know it is not in the original language, but it helps you to clarify what tongue, what tongue. Unknown meaning to say it's a language but not known to another person. All right? The other person doesn't know this language, but it is a language. Not angelic tongues as we've studied what angelic tongues um, it's not. Now, then it says, now look at here, verse 2. Now, they argue with you. But, but the Bible says, tongue, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not to men, but to God. You see, so you should speak to God in tongues because the Bible says, you, when you speak in tongues, you speak to God. Look at verse 3. Now, he says, uh, sorry, verse 4, verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. You see, don't the Bible, don't, doesn't, doesn't God want us to Edify ourselves. Edify means build up, all right? Build up. God wants us to build ourselves up. And this gift of tongues is what God uses to help you to speak to Him, number one, in verse two. And number two, in verse four, to help you build yourself up. So they encourage you to speak in tongues. Now, how are you going to answer that? How are you going to answer that? Now, please read the context very carefully. Paul is not saying, Paul is not encouraging them to speak in tongues to edify themselves. In fact, Paul is making this point. 
clear. I am not encouraging you to speak in tongues to encourage yourself. I am telling you that when you speak in tongues, it's only for one key purpose among a few others. One of the key purposes is that you edify others. Look at verse 1. He says, well, follow after charity. Now he says, charity is the aim. That is what you follow and hit towards. Charity means you do something to benefit others. All right? It's not about charity to yourself. So he said, now, the aim to follow is charity, to benefit others. Then he says, and desire spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are desired for you to fulfill charity. Then he says, then he, now he begins to um, rebuke them. They say, four. They say, please follow after charity. If you want spiritual gift, that is the aim. Now this is, but verse 1, but rather that you may prophesy. See, you can desire spiritual gift, but the aim is so that you can prophesy. Prophesy means you teach something God gives you and you speak it to someone else. Then verse 2, for he that speaketh in unknown tongues speaketh not unto men. He said, you see, the problem with you is this. You speak in tongues not to some, for someone to understand and to benefit someone, but unto God. So he said, only God understands you. Of course, if they're speaking in genuine tongues, God gave them the, the, the language. Only God understands you. Now, what is the point? God gave you tongues in order that you may prophesy, in order that others may benefit from it. That is why he says, For no man understandeth him. He said, No man will understand you. But now he says, Verse 3, But, but is, the, is the word that we must, under, we must notice. He said, this is what you should be doing, but, all right? But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification. He said, you see, the whole purpose of tongue is not to speak to yourself and speak to God. It's useless. Follow charity. Use it to speak to men. Then men will be, ben will be benefited, men to edification, in verse 3. Then in verse 4, he says, he that speaketh unto unknown tongue edified himself. Now, this is a rebuke, an open rebuke. So you have to read the tone, Open rebuke, say, why are you doing this? You are selfish. You are proud. You do this to benefit no one, just to show off. Only you yourself will benefit from the message. Then his verse 4, he used the word, but again. But he that prophesied edifies the church. You see, the, when, when these words are used, well, speak to yourself, edify yourself, it's used as a rebuke. It's used as a, as a, as a statement to tell them, don't do this. Instead, people read it and say, do this. All right? So, read the context carefully. Now, to be very clear about the context, verse 5, I would that you speak with tongues. They say, I'm not, I'm not saying that you, you, you don't have, I'm, I'm against you having the gift. Yeah, if God gives you the gift, yeah, I want you to have it. But he says, verse 5, but. You see, full of but, but, but. He's scolding them. But, but, but. But, in verse 5, but rather that ye may prophesy. You see, the whole point I want you to speak in tongues if it is God's gift for you, but I want you to use it for prophesying, for teaching, all right, for telling what God gives you as a message. Next of all, greater is he that speaketh, um, that prophesies, than he that speaketh with tongues. You see, but that he may, but that he interpret that church may receive edifying again. So you see, he's saying, whether you can speak in tongue or can't speak in tongue, don't keep wanting to speak in tongue if you don't have the gift. The main thing is prophesying. It is not about speaking in tongues that make you great. Look at verse 5. It is not about speaking in tongues that make you great. It is prophesying to edify, to build up others. That is what makes you useful to God. All right, so if someone says this, then explain the context. Now, God, he, now God, uh, Paul becomes, becomes more sarcastic now. He is getting really upset with the church. Look at verse 5. Now, now, brethren, I come unto you speaking, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? So he said, I, Paul, when I come to you and I keep speaking to you in a tongue, in a language that you don't understand, what's the point, right? So Paul is not saying, I speak in tongue to edify myself. He said, it's pointless. It should not be. Look at verse 7. And even things without life giving sound, whether they pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is pipe or harp? So Paul begins to use even instruments to say, come on, you know in your daily life, if you hear an instrument and it can't be recognized, how do you know what's the message? Battle, battle sound, all right? 
they don't understand. Is this battle sound? What are we supposed to do? Look at verse, um, verse, um, verse 9. Now, so likewise, ye ex except ye utter the by tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For he shall speak into the air. Does it get more sarcastic than that? Now he's saying, you keep speaking in tongues, right? No one understands. And you think you're edifying yourself and speaking to God and that's useful. And he says what? No, you're not even speaking to God. God gave you the message. God don't need you to tell him the message. God don't need you to speak to him in tongues. And he say, for ye speak into the air. You know, there are some Chinese phrases that describe this kind of things. I, I guess in other languages, uh, you just, you just uh, air back, that's all. Speak to the air. Now then look at um, verse 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian to me. Right? So he said, we are like barbarians to one another. We don't know what we are talking about. So when you read from verses 1 to verse 11, you will know Paul is not saying, go speak in tongues to edify yourself. Go speak in tongues to speak to God. He says, no, tongues are not meant for edifying yourself. All right, so how do you answer that? Now, you must be clear in your heart. Otherwise, you hear this. Oh, yeah, tongues to edify myself. God wants me to be spiritual, right? Yeah, you know, church says tongues have ceased. I'm going to secretly, quietly in my own room practice this because I want to be strong. I want to be spiritually strong. Your intent is right, but God never meant it for that. So don't do that, all right? Now, hence, there is a part of the BP movement that continues to, to believe that we should speak in tongues privately. It is good for you, that kind of idea. So understand the context. Look at verse 12. Now, it says, even so, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gift, he said, there's nothing wrong that you want to have spiritual gift. But what for? What is it for? Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Seek spiritual gift to edify others. Follow after charity. Not for your self-edification. Whenever someone will say, I will speak in tongues for my own spiritual growth, you shouldn't, you shouldn't stop me. Then quote them this verse. It is not meant for that. And when it's not meant for that, you are going to speak in a false language, false tongue. All right? By the way, you know that many um, um, temples, Chinese temples especially, um, they have mediums. You know mediums? All right? We call them tangkis. All right? Nothing to do with the tongue, huh? but I think it's interesting is they are called tangkis. All right? They speak in tongues. Many of these false religions, when they go into a trance, they, they, they speak like these people in the charismatic churches. It's not a language. It's a demon possession. Right? Don't yield yourself to that. So be aware of that. So teens, young ones, when your friends say, you know I speak in tongues, after that I feel very, I feel very strong spiritually. Don't go home and say, maybe I want that as well. God, God says, don't do that rather than do that. All right, so I hope that it becomes clearer to you. Now then, now let us then now move to, all right, so I covered the two main things, tongue speaking and um, um, miracles, performing miracle, mi miraculous healings and so on. Now before I forget, now we are not saying that God does not perform miracles today. Neither are we saying that God does not heal someone miraculously today anymore. Please know the difference. When God says that, when the Bible shows us three major periods in Christian history where God performed many miracles, all right? And God says, Christ himself said, the fourth period where you see many miracles, those will be the, that is the period of the false miracles. So this, we are in the fourth period, which is, um, where, you, where you seem to see miracle is the false one. The first three are from God. The fourth one will be from Satan. Know that. Um, now, when we say that God does not do all these things anymore today, what we're saying is this. It is not like those periods where it's something that is regular. It is, it is in proliferation. Many, many occurrences of it, right? And people ask for it, and it happens. So when we say this period of 
uh, miracles is, is over, we are saying these common occurrences of miracles is over. So sometimes, yes, people can get healed miraculously, whether believers or unbelievers, God can still do that. But it is not the common way. The, the, the period of miracles as the charismatic want it to be anymore. All right? That if when you see this kind of pull, uh, many claims of it, it is the period in Matthew 24, right? The false miracles. Now, let us move to other areas of charismatism. All right? Please turn now to page, um, page 182 in your old book. 182 in your old book. 204 in your new book. Now, actually, turn to the page before that. 8181. Right now, there, these are a list of a typical um, characteristics of the charismatic movement. We are studying movement, so you must recognize them. All right, you must be aware of the characteristics. Well, one, lives are changed, souls are saved, Christians are revived, new interest in spiritual things. That is one of the claims. Please know that. Second, well, God is giving new revelations. Prophesy under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. New apostles. Another ca characteristic is they place greater emphasis on experience than the authority of Scripture. So when you see this kind of um, characteristic, don't get excited. Know that they, we are going to study them in detail, all right? So don't worry. You must recognize this is the, the traits of the charismatic movement. Number four, well, you need a second work of grace, baptism of the Holy Spirit. You've been saved. But have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? Oh, you haven't. You must seek it. So another one is, well, many unfounded claims of miraculous healings. I've talked about that. Um, and tongue speaking, well, is the Pentecostal tongue speaking in Acts 2. These are the characteristics. Now, let's study the first one. Turn to the next page. All right, turn to the next page. Now, this is very common. And I, today, I still hear that. Just a few months back, someone said this to me within our church. Right now, reports of good reports and changed lives. You say, you know, Pastor, but you know the charismatic movement now. They they have a lot of people that are very zealous. You know, their lives are so so holy, so godly. They are so much more zealous than us. You know, so Pastor, what's, what's, why why do we speak against them? Now look also. They will say things like, you know, my charismatic friends. They are more loving. They're more Christian-like than, than we, we are fundamentalists, you know. Um, these charismatic uh, people, uh, people in charismatic churches, they're so evangelistic compared to us. You see, they keep bringing people to church and the church keep growing. You see, they really love souls. And God is adding souls to the churches, right? More and more people. Look at them. There's so much more people than, than this, these fundamental churches, right? We are so dead, so unloving, so... so um, so, without zeal, so cold. Now, these are common statements. And we even have people who say, you know, my parents, they, they, I keep preaching the gospel to them. They are not interested. But since they went to this charismatic church, wow, they're full of, full of desire to read God's word. You know, you know Pastor, I, I brought my parents here. Um, you know, they have been trying for so long. You know, they come, they're not interested. But you know, they, their friends invited them to a charismatic church. They went there. Wow, then they got so, so fired up. You know, they want to believe in God. And then, you know, my mother, since she attended a charismatic church, you know, when she was attending fundamental churches, she's not interested. But since she attended a charismatic church, wow, she's been reading the Bible every day, praying. You know, her life has changed. Changed lives. Good report. Now, how are you going to um, think. Maybe you sit there and say, yeah, 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 everything you say is true. That's why I always, I always felt that I'd rather go to a charismatic church. Now, how are you going to answer this? Now, teens, young ones, maybe you feel the same way. See, your friends in the charismatic church is so lively, so exciting. I think I want to go there when I grow up. Now, first few things we remember, the first two things, tongues have seized. Number two, um, a lot of their claims of miracles are not what the Bible talks about. It's a movement that promotes um, the false 
miracles, signs and wonder movement. But what about these changed lives? Now, how are you going to answer that? Michelle. Other religions also have reports of changed lives. But what's your point? <laughs> okay, you can't use that as a basis. Then what is the basis? What else? God says, by their fruits. Now turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Now let's read verses 16 to 22. Matthew 7, 16 to 20. Well, well, let's look at 15 to 22, right? 15 to 22. Now, beware of false prophets. Are you there, Matthew 7, 15 to 22? Beware of false prophets, which come unto you, to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns or figs or thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring, a, bring forth evil fruit, but neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. All right? Okay, that's enough. Now, here, now how do you answer that? All right? So, I move to the next person, maybe um, uh, Anna Tiong. Good fruits, you know? Because God is very specific. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know that. Not only that, say, how can our church speak against these people? Because God says this, in, look, look at verse, 19, uh, verse 18. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. So how can you say the charismatic movement is a corrupt movement? They brought forth good fruit. Okay, Anna. <laughs> Unbelievers can do good deeds as well, but unbelievers don't read the Bible. You see, they brought forth good food. They kept reading the Bible, interest in the Word of God, interest in serving, interest in going to church. Is the fruit spreading the gospel? They spread the gospel more than us. That's why their church grows so big, right? Um, what about Janelle? What they do is not what God wants them to do. God wants us to read the Bible. God wants us to pray. God wants us to go to church. God wants us to serve. God wants us to evangelize. They do more, that and that, more of that than we do. Which in? Whether they glorify themselves, uh, it happens in, even in Bible, in Bible Presbyterian in fundamental churches, right? We can do those things to glorify ourselves. Last one, Benedict. You must follow God the Holy Spirit. Right. Now, you must follow God's definition of what is good. They read the Bible, they pray, they evangelize. That is God's definition of good, right? They still do that. But the th key is this. What is truly good? Well, it must be according to the Word of God. Everything according to the Word of God. In other words, when they disobey, or rather I put it this way, the Bible must be the basis of the test whether a movement is true or false, all right? So one of you was getting there, right? The other religions, other religions, many people also do many good works. Works is not the basis. The Word of God is. But you say, but for, for charismatic movement, they do all these things according, the Word wants us to do this. But the key thing is this. They do not 
obey when it comes to the the um, the um, the tongues have ceased. They will not obey it. Them are these miracles are false miracles. They ignore that. Constantly proven false. They ignore that. You see, you cannot take one facet. We studied about the preceptive will, right? You cannot take one facet and say, this is it. This is true. This must be God's work. must be God's will. But what about the parts that they, they deny the truth, many truths? What about those parts? You see, the test is, is the Word of God their sole basis. They later will say, they base it on experience. Experience, number one. So the first answer was correct. Other religions have all these experiences too. Are you then going to say, then I think I should be a Buddhist? See, Christian, when you begin to think that good works, good behavior, kindness, loving and all that is the basis to say that then this thing is true, this religion is true, this movement is true. One day you may just say, I think I... And honestly, many people say, Christians are worse than many other people in other religions that I know of. Then what are you going to do? Join those religions, number one. Number two, then you have to look at a cross. Do they obey every commandment of God? The, the obedience to the truth, that is good fruit. I repeat, again, <laughs> the obedience to every commandment of God, that is the test of good fruit. When a movement chooses to ignore, chooses to obey some, not obey some. Now, in fact, when a movement, when a form of Christianity chooses to obey some and not obey some, it's usually the most attractive Christianity. Please know that. You go to a church that promotes health and wealth gospel, which is contrary to scripture, you will grow. You will grow. You go to a church that promotes um, pop and rock music, which the charismatic movement typically are, you will grow, definitely. You see, growth is not the test. Good works, kindness, zeal is not the test. Even within Christianity, that the Word of God is the sole basis of authority for all our beliefs and practices, that is good fruit. That the Word of God is our sole authority of all our beliefs and practices, that is good fruit. Now, if you go further down, um, verse 21, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Christ clarified that. Please don't think that people say, Lord, Lord, and they do a lot of things. Then they are. They are going to heaven. But say, he that doeth the will of my Father. How do you know the will of my Father? The preceptive will is the clearest, known will of God. They will not submit to these things. Yes, I know, no one can argue with you from the language that tongues have ceased, but I need you to know this from my experience. All right, that is what we move to next. All right, move to the next one. Point number three, from my experience, my experience, I feel so much closer to God when I speak in tongues. For my experience and feeling, all right, I feel so much more of um, the desire for his word since I joined the charismatic movement. Now, there are people who leave sound churches. And after that, they say, you know, when I was in, in, in um, fundamental churches, I was very dead, you know. But when I went to a charismatic church, wow, you know, the feelings inside me, the experiences and all that, I became so revived. But what, but what about, you, you agree that you studied and you agree from the language that tongue have ceased. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. But you agree. I say, no, but, but then let me ask you, and my colleague asked me that openly, all right? When I show tongue has ceased, he said, you know, Joseph, I, I agree with you and I cannot argue with you. But how do you explain the experience that I had when I was driving on the highway? And he himself was anti-tongue speaking all his life. And he said, how do you explain that one day when I was driving on the road, I started to speak in tongues when I was driving? How do you explain that experience? How do you explain that experience? Actually, may I ask, um, okay, maybe I'll ask um, um, Gracia, how do you explain that experience? It is from who? 
not from God. Because the only thing is, if God says you have seas, then God break his own word? It cannot be from God then. The explanation is the authority, the Bible is our sole authority of practices, um, beliefs, feelings, and everything. It doesn't matter how you feel, what you experience. Now, please turn to 2 Corinthians. Now, no, no, don't turn there. All right, Matthew. Matthew, right? Matthew 7, 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have you not prophesied in thy name? Have you not in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? They are exactly asking God that. God, Lord Jesus Christ, what about the experiences that we had? They are exactly asking Christ that. What about the things that we have done and experienced? We experienced casting out demons, right? We experienced prophesying in your name. We experienced miracles, wonderful works. Lord Jesus, how do you explain that to us? Why are you sending us to hell? Well, the Lord says already, but he that doeth the will of my Father, it is not he that calleth me Lord, Lord. Just because the charismatic calls himself Christian, sing about the Lord Jesus Christ, pray to the Lord Jesus Christ, call him Lord, doesn't mean that they are in a true movement. Now, I'm not saying that all charismatics are not safe. I'm talking about the movement, understand that. And if you're in that movement, or your friends in that movement, there are those who are not saved because they believe in a false gospel. They became a Christian based on desiring these, these things, not to seek God, not to repent and turn to God and be holy. They want these experiences of high, they want these experiences of miracle, miraculous healings, they want the experiences of gaining money and fame. That is what they're seeking. So some are not saved because it's a false movement with the false gospel very often. So I say again, I'm not saying charismatics are not safe. Not all charismatics are not safe. And that is why you must know the word. Don't just sit there and just be entertained. Learn it. Note it. Help your friends. Be ready to talk to them about it. That is why you're studying this. All right? Not to sit here to criticize others. So now, here... What about experience? Well, experience must always be subjected to the Word of God. That is good fruit. When I experience something that, that is so wonderful, and when I know it is contrary to the Word of God, what is good fruit? I will do the will of the Father. I will obey His Word. I will say, this is false. I will ignore it, I will get rid of it, and I will condemn it, even though I experience it. I can experience being saved in a charismatic church. I can experience growth in a charismatic church. But the moment I know and I understand these things in there are false, I must leave the movement that is doing the will of my Father. Come up from among them, be separate. Experience, the Christian experience must always be subject to that. Because you can be, well, claim to be a Christian and suddenly you, and many have also experienced it and they, wrote, they write their testimony. When I joined Buddhism, when I joined Hinduism, when I joined um, the, the uh, Muslim religion, when I became a Muslim, oh, I experienced so much things that are different from Christianity. What are you going to do? Are you going to then join them? See, experience must always be subject to the word. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 14, uh, 13 to 15, 13 to 15, 13 to 15 reading. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers are also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Whose end shall be according to their works. Do they make the word of God the sole authority of their faith and practices? Now, look at verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, testimony themselves in the apostles of Christ. Is, does this not describe the third wave movement? Because the third wave movement, the pastors claim that they are the capital A apostles of Christ. They claim that. Why? Because they say we can foretell the future. Number two, verse 14. God wants the Christian, don't 
be marveled. Don't be, don't be so enthralled, in other words. When you see changed lives, when you see people become more zealous, when you see people well, so-called love God even more, more evangelistic. Why? Because he say Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Angel of light means this. When you look at it, it, is, it looks like light. So all these changed lives, transform and interest in all that, Satan will, will be able to have a movement that for all this that look like light, Satan is not going to deceive you with something that is so false. Look at verse, so please know, Satan, God says himself, can be transformed into an angel of light, not devil of darkness. Huh? That's how he's going to come to teach us. Number four, therefore it's no great thing if his ministers be transformed to his as the ministers of, right, of righteousness. Now, so it's no great thing if, if Satan's ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, but whose end is destruction. Meaning to say, ministers, these are pastors, full-time workers. Say, please don't be surprised. It is no great thing when the time comes. And then they already experience it. So change life, um, um, good reports, um, exp- pastors can make people really love God and all that. There are those, God says, ministers that appear to be ministers of righteousness, always tested by the word of God. Now turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Verse 22. Now let's read um, together. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet shall have spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Now, that is the warning. There will be false prophets. In fact, other verses warn that they will be put to death. Now, look at page 205 in your new book. 205 in your new book, 182 in your old book. 182, old book, 205, new book. Now, this is about the new revelation. So, there is this claim of new revelations, right? There is new revelation. Now, these capital A apostles, they are not talking about expounding the word of God. They are talking about new revelations. God spoke to me and God told me. Do you know why they are so exciting, these churches? No one likes to hear textbook. Everyone wants things outside that they, that they, can't, they don't get from the Bible. They want to hear all these exciting things. Now, now all these people say, all right, we have new revelations. But many of them who prophesy, prophesy, they never came true. They never came true at all. Now, in the Old Testament, you'll be put to death, you know. Now, what is the Christian supposed to de- depend on? Second Peter, please take 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. 19 reading we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart now here peter said i experienced speaking with christ i met christ face to face i even saw that his transfiguration on the mount of transfiguration but christian i need you to know i'm going to die this is what he's saying in this chapter i'm going to die when I am no longer around, just in case you get worried, worried, who is going to teach us God's word? And he says this, we have a more sure word of prophecy. You want prophecy? You have a more sure one in your own hands. The Bible was already forming, all right? They already have the whole Old, Note, Old Testament. He said, the word of God. And he says, the, the, and when you receive the, the Bible, he said, it is a more sure word of prophecy, the word of God. Because in verse, verses um, 20, um, he talks about Scripture, knowing this verse that knows prophecy of Scriptures is of private interpretation, all given by God. So Paul says, when Peter says, you have the Bible, 
when you have the Bible, it's even better than prophecy. This is a more sure word. All right? So, Christian, we have the Bible, and that is the complete revelation. Whatever God wants you to know, it is there already. Now, now next week, we will... Actually, let's, let's finish this here. Now, page 183, 183. Now, what is the best thing? New revelation? Now, if you keep thinking you want new revelation, look at verse 13, all right? Look at your page 183. Look at the, the Bible verse, 1 Corinthians. But that which is perfect is come. We explained the word perfect already. All right, perfect is in neuter. It refers to the Bible. How do we know it's the Bible? All right, now this word perfect is, look at James 1.25. But whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty is describing the same thing, the law of liberty, the Bible. The same word is used, perfect. So when the perfect, when the Bible is come, that which is in part will be done away with. There's no more prophecies and new knowledge, new revelation. This, when the Bible is come, that which is perfect is come, which James also said, look at the perfect law of liberty. It is gone. Now, if you look at, first, at, at the word, for now we see through a glass darkly, through a glass darkly. That's the same word that James uses in James 1 as well. A man look at a glass and forget what he looks like. It's the same word. All right, so the Bible uses this word glass and perfect to describe scriptures. And when scriptures is come, it's complete. There is no more new revelation ended. All right, so the charismatic movement is not of God. Let us turn to God in prayer. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts. Uh, what church dropouts say. Why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of well, I take the American view. Um, they are the most readily available results. They stopped attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from